guys, feel free, amen, to hopefully say hello to them uh, uh, before they leave again, okay? So with that, Rosemary, if you want to come forward. Thank you, Lord. I'll turn it over to you. God Thank bless you. you, okay? Thank you. We are so blessed to be here today. We love you guys. You're like family to us, and when we come, we are so happy to be here. And today, I just want to give God the glory for everything that we do in Honduras, and especially for my life. This August, I'll be 77 years old. <laughs> I give God the praise and the glory for that. <laughs> because I'm doing two jobs in Honduras, and I'm not retiring whatsoever. My youth is renewal like the eagle each and every day. <laughs> And we start off, this is what we do in Honduras. Choloteca, we are in a small town called Choloteca. We've been there this October, we'll be going on 28 years. I praise God for that. <laughs> Most missionaries only stay on the field, I've heard, for 20 years. We've gone almost eight years over that we're going. And we're going to continue as long as God's will for us to be there. On, we start on Monday morning. We teach at Abundant Life Christian School. It's a private school. I'm the pastor of the school, and Barbara Moraine is the math teacher of one, of one subject in math, a pre-calculus, and she's the Bible teacher this year of classes from 7th to 12th grade. And I'm the pastor over... Uh, I start out on Monday morning, I teach, we have teachers devotional in the mornings. On Tuesday morning, we start with primary from K-4 to 6th grade. On Wednesday, I have Hovenist group, youth groups from 7th grade to 12th grade. On Thursday and Friday, I'm checking the classrooms in the mornings to make sure that every, every class given a devotional before they start their curriculums. And that's very important. I leave, I've been promoted. I leave around 11.30, and Ms. Barbara have had an opportunity to take me home each day so I can get a little rest to start our evening meetings. And this is, this is the this is us. Pray for us. <laughs> Pass it. This is Monday night, our Monday night meeting. Uh, we are, all our meetings, most of them are outside. On Sunday, every other Sunday, we have a roof over us, but we're still outside. And we have one church that the, the uh, sponsors from the United States built, so we should, should, I will show you that one. But there's only one inside that we are inside. We have six months of dry season, six months of rainy season. That's our winter. We have a summer and a winter. In our winter time, you will get wet. If you ever came to visit us during our meetings, you're going to get wet if you come between August to November. You're going to get wet. So we're preaching sometime, and I'm holding a mic, and it's lightning and thundering, but I know God is my provider, and I know I can trust in him. <laughs> we have uh, celebrations on September the 10th, Children's Day, and we pass out presents. We pass out presents for Mother's Day. We pass out presents for Father's Day, and uh, we just passed out presents for Christmas also. This is Monday. Tuesday night, Tuesday night meeting is at our director's house, and we live next door. You might not be able to see those walls, but beyond those walls are our house. Now, what we do at these meetings at nighttime, Barbara teach one week, and I teach the other week. We teach them the word of God. We give them a Bible verse to memorize that night. We give them a treat if they memorize a Bible verse. During our holidays, we have celebrations, our ministry team, workout a program, dancing, puppet shows, uh, dramas, we love everything. But they're in control of that, and we are blessed because they take control of that. 
Now, on Monday night, we can have up to 300 to 350 people on a holiday. On a Tuesday night, we can have up to 400 people. We also feed these people. This is what you, your money, when you send it to Honduras, this is what we're doing with your money and other people's money. But we also, we don't trust in man, we're trusting in God. He's our provider. Amen. And he takes care of us for 27 years. He have taken care of us. We feed them. Uh, we used to, when we were small groups, we would feed them dinners. But now we have grown to be big groups, so we cannot feed dinners. We give them a chicken sandwich. We give them a drink. We give them a fruit. We give them a cookies, chips, and a, and a bomb bomb, lollipop. But this is what we try to do, and we give them a fruit. So it's like a bad lunch. But it means so much to these kids in Honduras. You're talking about some days that they don't even have food. And when you come alone and have a lunch bag for them, they're happy for that. And they're ready to eat it then, but they have to take it home to their family. And you're talking about not like a two or three in the family, but maybe eight or ten in a family. So this still hurts my heart. Pass it, please. This is Wednesday night, and, and this is, we have a pavilion like in the center of it, but we have people all around on Wednesday night. On a holiday, Children's Day, especially in September, the 10th of September, we can have 700, 800 people right here in this yard, and it's amazing. And what blessed me this year was when I sit at the, the gate sometimes because everybody want to go through the, the, uh, the be in line for the food, and I love passing out the food line, but somebody else always want to pass out food. So when I'm not passing out food, I sit at the, the gate with them going out. And there was a mother, and there was a grandmother, and there was a little boy. And this little boy had, and I'm watching them, and this little boy, he was about four or five years old, and he had a sandwich in his hand. And they were mad with him because they, he didn't put the sandwich in the bag to take home. And his mother hit him, the grandmother hit him, and he started crying. And I'm looking at this, and I ran over and got a sandwich, and I gave it to him. And I was hoping that they did not take that sandwich away from that little boy so he could hold it. He was the happiest little boy that he was able to hold his sandwich. Pass it, please. This is still Wednesday night, a different section of Wednesday night. Pass. This is Thursday night Bible study. This is our call TGG. Thursday group girls. These are teachers from our Abundant Life School. And through Barbara and my ministry, they all receive the Holy Spirit. They all love God. We get together. We pray together on Thursday. We share the word together. We eat together. We have fellowship together. It's beautiful. They love the Lord, and that's beautiful. Pass it, please. This is our Saturday group. We have bleachers there, and during a holiday, you can, we can have people from one end of the bleachers to the other end. And, and you can see that there's a lot of people. They really love coming on a holiday. And one holiday, September, we had 1,000 people. This is our basketball court at our school. And we had 1,000 people there to serve. And sometimes it's hard for me. Because I'm thinking that we're only going to have 400 people, and we might have 500 people. So I, I love to see everybody eat because I know these people are hungry, and I know that they love the Word of God, but they also, we want to fill their stomachs. So I have my ministry team running around to the store, grab some meat buy some bread, buy some mayonnaise, and let's make some sandwiches, let's do some juice or something. So everybody that come will be able to get something to eat and a present. Pass it, please. This is our Sunday, one of our Sunday meetings, St. Louis. This guy, we used to meet with him through the, on, like on Friday, but on Sunday, he wasn't having that many people to his church. So he invited us to come to him to have services on Sunday so more people can come to his church. And it's been a blessing. We've been able to put his roof on from the sponsors in the United States, and we've been able to um, 
he's going to, he, you can see half of it, a flow. It's all sand. And he's trying to cement the whole flow and before the rainy season. So we're just praying for that, that God will help us on that. San Luis, pass it please. This is Lemoyne, another place on Sunday. We can have, you can see the people there. Holidays, we can definitely have a thousand people. And I would never want to turn anybody away. So let them come in. My, our body God, he always say, miss, you want to stop? No, let them come in. Let, we, we don't have to worry about problems with the, the government or uh, problems like you have here. We can pack them in in Honduras and we pack them in. So I thank God for the people that come. Pass it, please. This is also Le Monde Circuit. And this lady, her name is Marcellus. We love her. She's over 100 years old. And she's there by herself. But she gives you this biggest bear hug that you can receive. And she still have a memory because every time we come, she always tell me she want coffee. And she always tell Barbara, I want shampoo and lotion. But she's, she's so beautiful. We love this lady. Pass it, please. This is our car. Her name is Compassion. She's 17 years. And she in good condition. We had a paint job on her. And I, we've been blessed. Last Sunday, I was sharing about the transportation. I had been praying for transportation. In the rainy season, we have the back full of people, and they get wet. And they come to the meetings all soaking wet. And they don't, do not complain, no grumble. They just continue to sing, worship God, busy. And I want something to cover them that they don't have to be read. They're with us every night. They're faithful, our ministry team. And this guy heard me last year, and I've been praying for years for this. And last Sunday after church, this guy came up to us and said, we want to buy you a van. <laughs> God is good all the time. He's our provider. Pass it, please. This is the food, the sandwiches, the cookies, the lollipops, the oranges, the drinks. I love everything there. This is still the morning we pass it out. Pass it, please. And these are the gifts. This is probably uh, one of the holidays. I don't really know which one. But we pass out different things, shampoo. And the beautiful thing about it, a, a child. Maybe Christmas time, you would think that that child would want a toy. We have beautiful toys there for the kids. God blesses us when we go to a store. And I would think, oh, she wants a baby doll. She looks like she wants a baby doll. And I, and I say, would you like a baby doll? Or would you like shampoo? Or would you like lotion? They go for shampoo. The basic stuff. Shampoo, lotion. The basic stuff. And it hurts, but God is good. Pass it, please. This is our ministry team that we love and thank God for. And they are faithful. You can see all of those. And all of these people get on our little truck. Compassion. That's a lot of people. Up, up, up you go in the, in the inside. And in the back, up, up, up. Get on each other's lap. Pass it, please. And this is beautiful. Honduras is breathtaking. Pass it, please. That's the ocean. This is Salazar, another place that we go when we bring mission teams. And it's sad there because you talk about poverty. It's, there's more poverty there than there is in Choloteca. And they'd be so happy to see us. They wanted a church after we had been ministered to them for years and years and years, and they built them a church. They sold their belongings to build them a church that they can worship and praise God, and that's from the seed of us from being there. And I just thank God for that. Pass it, please. This is them. We sending food up. We wasn't able to go in Christmas time, and we got sending. A, this the men that live up there, and we sending a truck of food to them. Pass it, please. 
also in our school, we are blessed. We are blessed this year. We took two groups. We took one group to the elderly homes like you're going to today, the nursing home. And this is all the food that we took to them. Pass it, please. And this is our seniors. We took them to an orphanage that we built. And they pre uh, did a presentation for the orphanage. We fed them. They played soccer with them. They had a good time with them. Also, I didn't mention with our ministry team, we have been blessed for years. Our uh, young people, all of the kids, the, in our, the parents of our kids, in our ministry team, we've been able to sponsor them in a private school for years. Three people have graduated from this private school, and they're doing very well, and we still have five more kids in this private school. This is all of the things that we are doing in Honduras. What you're doing, you're part of what we're doing, God's hands and his feet in Honduras. We love you guys. Pass it, please. This is our seniors and our director in the middle of Miss Barbara and myself. We love them. They laugh. We love them, and we're going to miss them. Sometimes some of them come back to see us. Pass it, please. This is three girls. We have a conference every year. Our youth, this, our school, they go to a conference, and this is our Bible team, and they run the Bible uh, class that, the, the, that year. We run. We run the trophy. And that's a blessing. This score is very high from Choloteca, Honduras. Miss Popper, the Bible teacher. Pass it, please. <laughs> This is mangoes. You can see the happy, happiness on my face. I love mangoes, and they are delicious. And I got to touch one. I like that. Pass it, please. <laughs> Pass it. That's number five. And we just want to thank you for your love and your giving and your prayers. God bless you, and we love you more and more and more and more. In Jesus' name. Good morning, everybody. How are you this morning? It is beautiful here in the summertime, isn't it? Nice and cool. You're probably thinking it's warm outside, but nice and cool. And we always enjoy coming to this church and visiting with you. You're our partners, um, missionary partners. You have joined with us on the mission field, and you are feeding the poor and healing the sick and we haven't raised the dead yet but that's probably coming in our future <laughs> and we're preaching we're faithful to preach the word of God to the poor and at the school we preach the word of God to the rich um, the important thing here is that they have opportunities for higher education around the world and they can pretty much live in any country they want afterwards and many of them are leaders in our nation. We've been there long enough on the mission field that, that, that they're leaders in our nation having key positions. And, and we were able to plant God's word, God's love in their hearts from the time they were four years old until they graduated from high school. So it, it really is powerful, and you're a part of that. And I'm here to say thank you for giving to the Lord, giving to the missions in Honduras. You're faithful, and we appreciate you. Amen. Um, today I'm going to start with prayer. It's not a usual message about prayer. So we're going to start with John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6 is what I'm going to read. I'm reading from the NLT. I really don't care what version is up here. It's always good to compare versions. I, I often compare the NLT to the King James um, just to see how they're both worded, um, to, see, to get a better feeling for the Word of God. But I'm reading from the NLT. John 14, verse 1, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. Um, we talked about not worrying, not being afraid this morning. 
not complaining, not grumbling, not mumbling. We talked about all that. We sang about that this morning and that we would trust him. And this is what Jesus wants us to do. Instead of being afraid or when we are afraid, trust God. Trust Jesus. Okay, very important verse here. We are not to be troubled. Our hearts are not to be troubled by anything, by man, by unpaid bills, by foreclosures of houses. We are not to be troubled. We are to trust. Amen? Verse 2, there is more than enough room in my father's home. Isn't that nice to know? More than enough room. If this were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? Now, this is also comforting. Um, comforting and hard. Jesus is leaving. He's telling the disciples, I'm leaving. That's hard. But he tells us, I'm going to prepare a place for you in my Father's home, and there's more than enough room for you. So it's comforting and troubling, but don't let your hearts be troubled. Jesus said, I'm leaving. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Verse 3, when everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. That gives us a vision of our future. He's coming back for us that we might always be with him where he is. Again, very, very comforting. Let not your heart be troubled. Trust in God. And you know the way to where I am going. Now, Here's a disciple that has no clue what's going on, and so if we're clueless, don't sweat it, because even Jesus is 12, we're clueless from time to time. In fact, most of the time, they really didn't know much of what was going on. And one of the disciples, Thomas by name, said, no, we don't know, Lord, no, we don't know. Thomas said, we have no idea where you are going. So how can we know the way? And this is where the famous verse comes in. Most of us have memorized it. Jesus told him, if you're not, you can meditate on this and memorize it for yourself. Jesus told Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way. And when I'm talking about prayer this morning, I'm really talking about connection. I heard Pastor Ben mention that word this morning when he came up, a connection. I have known Christians that deeply love God, deeply love God, and yet the connection with Jesus is lacking. Um, it is possible to be filled with the Holy Spirit have Jesus living in you and still feel so far away from God. All you really have to do is go a few days without praying, a few days without reading God's word. Days lead into weeks and weeks lead into months. And it's not long before you, yet the spirit-filled believer, is feeling a distance from God. You're not feeling a closeness to God. You're not walking or being led by the Holy Spirit. And so what I'm going to mention is that prayer is a journey. It's a trip, a road trip, you might say. It doesn't have to be on the road. You can go ahead and fly. All right? Prayer is from one location to another location, and the goal is to have a closeness, a spiritual intimacy with our Lord. And if our hearts are not right, we're not going to have or experience that intimacy or that closeness with Jesus or with the Father. We're not going to feel like we're on fire, like our life is a flame, that zeal for the things of God. We're distracted, aren't we, by the things in this world. Um, traveling in through the Pennsylvania countryside with the sun shining down, Rosemary and I had the benefits of some things in this world. We tuned in to Pandora and um, a worship channel, and briefly, just briefly, the, the GPS would say, turn right. You know, and then it would go back to beautiful worship music. These are the things that are in the world. Now, the worship, you know, is nice. It's not of the world. But, but the, the, the technology is of the world. And we can get so distracted 
by the world that we need something called prayer to take a journey to get our hearts right, to be washed and cleansed so that we can actually hear from God. We could be praying to God and, and ask God for a prayer, and we're saying, God, why haven't you heard me? And the problem is that God isn't, isn't it, it's not that he hasn't answered you. It's that your heart is so full with the world that you can't even hear what God is saying. And so prayer is given to us as a gift that we might get connected to God, that we might see God, that we might hear God, that we might know God, that we might touch God, that we might led, be led by the Spirit of the Lord. That when the Holy Spirit prompts us, we're not too dull, that we can't respond immediately to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And you see, if we're distracted by the world that is around us, we miss that, and we miss God, and we miss God's way, and we miss God's word, and we miss God's answer to our prayers. We just miss it. We're plugged into the world and not into God. Amen? So prayer is a journey. Now we're going to journey through the word of God to the book of Revelation, and you can turn to Revelation chapter 3. But in Revelation 2 and 3, it, there are seven letters to churches. These, these, ch these churches were cities in Asia Minor during the time that John was writing the letters that Jesus gave him to give to the churches. And the very first church, Ephesus, is really representative of the apostolic church, the time period in the church age. We're in the church age. The church age is between the death of Jesus and his return again, which is in our future. This is called the church age. And prophetically speaking, these letters represent the church age, where we are right now. And the very first letter was when the apostles were alive. Now, after the apostles died, all of them, including John, the book of Ephesus is still in the church age, and he, Jesus, had this complaint about the church. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. This is in Revelation 2, 4. They lost their first love, and this was in the very first and second centuries. It wasn't far after Jesus had risen from the dead. And the apostles, you know, had, had spoken and left a very recent testimony. And yet still, they had left their first love, and they didn't love God like when they first got saved. Or like when the, first, when the church was first born, they didn't love him like that. The fire wasn't there. The intensity wasn't there. Now, the beauty about these seven letters is we can read all seven letters and receive information and rebukes and commendation about all from all of the seven letters. We can, you know, there, we'll see all of these seven churches in the church today. There is persecution like the Smyrna Church. There is, you know, activity like the Philadelphia Church, Mission Age and Revival. And so all of those are representative of right now, so you can receive from all seven letters. But where we're actually living is at the end of time, at the end of the church age, in the church age of Laodicea, which is the seventh letter. This is the church age where we are actually living now. And I would like you to go to Revelation chapter 3, remembering that all of the word of God is for us, and we can learn from all of the word of God. Revelation chapter 3. And we're going to look at 15 through 20, again the NLT. Jesus is speaking to the church, and this is our church time period. I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. Now, it's not, he, even in this letter, we can see that not everybody it falls under this category. There are people on fire. There are people pursuing God, seeking God, desiring the presence of the Lord and to be covered by the Lord. But generally speaking, this is for the last letter. This is the last letter, the last church part of the church age. You are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. 
You see, many times we are just focused on our own general comfort. Getting a nice home and being comfortable in that home. And our, our mind is really on our quality of life, our state of life on this earth. And we're not centered around the kingdom of the living God. In many cases, this is a true statement. We are not on fire for the living God. We're not. We are more interested in God blessing our general life right here and God providing for us while we're on this earth right here and all we're concerned about is here and now. We're not concerned about God and his kingdom. We see the world more than we see God and that's what it talks about in this letter. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. Isn't that powerful? This is the attitude of the people in the last stage of the church age. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire, then you will be rich. Also buy white garments from me so you will not be shamed by your nakedness. And ointment for your eyes so you will be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love, so be diligent and turn from your indifference. Turn from your indifference. God is committed to working in you. Um, Ephesians chapter 2. We are his workmanship. God is committed to working in you. The Holy Spirit will prompt us. Oftentimes he gets our attention through our family members or close friends. Someone, you'll just annoy someone, and then you'll annoy someone else in the same way. And you'll annoy someone else in the same way, and they'll call you out on that. And the Holy Spirit will come up to you and say, you don't have to be that way. You're allowed to change. You don't have to be that way. You don't have to be like you. You don't have to do it your way. You can do it like me. You can look like me, Jesus says. You can strive to do it my way, not your way. And so we don't have to have our husbands or our, our wives accept us the way we are. You turn to your husband and say, that's the way I am. Get used to it. No. Let the Holy Ghost come beside you and respond to the prompting of the Holy Ghost and be more like him. You don't have to be like you. You can be like him. You don't have to hold on to you. You don't have to hold on to your convictions. You can be like him. It's better. It's a better way. And let the Holy Ghost discipline you. If you get angry, let the Holy Ghost calm you. If you're bitter, let the Holy Ghost forgive you. If you're angry, let the Holy Ghost take it away. Give it to the Lord. You don't have to be sad. You don't have to be miserable. You don't have to be complaining. You can give it to the Lord and you can yield to the Lord. He is committed committed to making something beautiful out of your life. Verse 20, look, I stand at the door and knock. He is knocking. Some of us hold him so far away. We hold him so far away. We're so interested in ordering by phone on Starbucks and picking it up without waiting in line. We're so into that. We just love it that we lose sight of our awesome, most amazing God who is greater than Starbucks. Just saying. I'm not saying you can't like Starbucks. I love when someone gives me a Starbucks card and I can go in and use my star. It's God gives grace. But I'm saying, what is your heart? Are you into that stuff? Are you into God? What are you into? 
It's nothing wrong with enjoying some of the things that are around us, but what are you into? We need to be into God. Jesus, we need to be into God. And it's a journey. Be diligent and turn from your indifference. This is why it takes time to attain intimacy. It takes time to get close, personal relationship with God. It takes time because our hearts are not ready. Jesus gave a parable in which there are four states of the human heart, some of which is hard, shallow, thorny, and then good soil. And it is our job to cultivate our heart. It is our job, our job, not God's job, it is our job to turn our hearts over to God's hands. It is our job to pursue God and to seek after God. That's our job. It is our God job to pray for, that God would create a clean heart, that we might hear him, that we might see him. him. It is our job to turn to the living God. It's a journey to intimacy. There are things that trip us up. There are things that hinder us. There are things that block us from God's presence. There are things that bring darkness into our lives. And I want to give you advice today that if there is anything dark in your life, that you would shut that door, whether it's a TV show or a book, a video game, any, a person. If there is any opening to darkness in your life, that you would shut that door. Attitudes that, that are stinking. Thoughts that are not becoming of God. I have stopped competition. I used to be very competitive. I'm an, I, I used to say I am athletic. Now I say I am a Christian. But I have long since turned away from any competition. Now we get into Bible competitions, and I want our school wants to be honored among all the Abundant Life schools. There's eight schools now, and we compete every year. And I want our school to shine before the other schools. So I do like the Bible competition. Our girls scored like 1,000, and no one else even got 600. I'm not trying to brag about our schools. <laughs> But I'm saying the competition doesn't do very well with me. It brings out attitudes that I don't need in my life. Driving in a car brings out words that, not, not curse words. I've been in the Lord too long for that. But, oh man, he's a jerk. You know, stuff like that. Why are they so slow? You know, I mean, might as well put it in reverse. I am ready to put this car in reverse because that car is so slow. But there are some attitudes that we have, and family members can pull it out of us, can't they? That ugliness of us can come out when we're driving, competing in a board game, playing Monopoly, having fun. These attitudes can come out, and there's, there's some tweaking. God wants to bring his paintbrush, make some changes, redirect. You know, GPS, redirect. You get on the wrong road. You get off track. I have a Bible devotional, and, and you read it, and it says on track. But if you miss a day or two, it says one missed day, two missed days, three missed days. How far are you going to go? Four missed days, and you say, okay, I'm finally going to get caught up. And then it says on track. And that's what we need to do with our heart. Guard your heart, for out of your heart comes the issues of your life. Guard your heart. Keep it on track. Keep it on the good path. Keep it on the safe path. Keep it on God's path for your life. It is so easy to get distracted in the church age of Laodicea, to get your eyes off of God, and then you get in trouble. You fall, you fall into debts, you're unsuccessful, you mess up on your job, you're, you're messing up with your family, then you get in trouble and you need to stay on track, watch over your heart, things that are pulling us away from God. What must we do? Repent. That's what we must do. And change. 
make the adjustments that the Holy Spirit is nudging us to make and respond quickly to the Holy Spirit. Respond quickly. Prepare your heart for climbing into the presence of the living God. Cultivate your heart for good soil. Desire a pure heart, for it's the pure in heart that will see God. You need to see God more than you see the world. You need to see God more than you see a beautiful sunset. And it's the pure in heart. It's the clean in heart. If you're not wanting to change, you have a hard heart. But if someone corrects you, even though you're an adult, if someone corrects you and you easily adjust to change, I'm not saying it doesn't hurt, but you're easy to change your wrong ways, then you have a pure heart. It's just that simple. Are you willing to be changed by the living God? And if you're willing to be changed by the living God, you have a pure heart. Turn to God and make those adjustments quickly. Let go, I heard somebody say that today, let go of all, including yourself, and come to the living God. Let's turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And we are going to start reading at verse 10. For God's will was for us to be made holy. Did you know that was God's will? For us to be made holy. Us impure, evil. You know, you could have evil within you. Did you know that? You can have evil around you. It's called the world. You can have evil above you. It's called the enemy, dominions, and principalities above you. But it's God's will for us to be made holy. Jesus in you. Jesus around you. Jesus above you. Amen? For us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Because Jesus died on a cross, we can be made holy. This sacrifice was once for all time. If you look that up in the Greek, it's pretty funny. You know, you can expound on it when you go into the Greek. But look this one up in the Greek, and you know what it actually means? Once for all time. That's exactly what it says. Once for all time. One sacrifice is good for all people groups, for all nations of the world. It is good through all generations. It is good after your fifth sin, your tenth sin, your hundredth sin, or your thousandth sin. Once for all time, it's still working today. This sacrifice, once for all time, his death on the cross is good for all time, and it's good right now. It's still working. Once for all time. Verse 12. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. Verse 14. I'm a math teacher, so I might as well say these are the even verses that we're reading today. Verse 14, for by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. If you are born again in Christ, been born from above, you have been made perfect now. If you are not perfect now, come up to Pastor Ben after the meeting and get born again from above. Amen? That means perfect identity. You. Perfect value. Perfect worth. But we're being made holy. <laughs> so there's still a process. 
There's still a process here. Let's go down to 16. This is the new covenant I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts. I will write them on their minds. Verse 17, I'm doing an odd one. Then he says, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. This is because that one sacrifice of Jesus, he doesn't have to die every year. He doesn't have to die every time we sinned. It was one sacrifice, good for all time. Anybody applies their faith in them, it will work for you. You have faith in the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, his resurrection and ascension. It will work for you. Doesn't matter. There is no if, but, when, why. There's no excuse for this that will stop it. It is good. It is good. It is good. It works. For those who have faith in him, it is working. And when the sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifice. Verse 20, by his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. Jesus himself, by his death, remember when the curtain of the temple was written from top to bottom, it was ripped, torn in two, he has opened the way into the most holy place. Don't take that for granted, and it is a journey. Just because you say, I can go into God's bedroom anytime I want, doesn't mean that you're doing it. Just because you say, I have access to God, doesn't mean you have that connection with God. Go on in and get that connection with God. Many people say that the communion, taking of the juice and taking of the bread, is it. That's the communion. That is not the communion with God. That's just remembering what he did on the cross. The communion with God is eating his flesh, drinking his blood, being plugged into the vine. Where are the branches? He's the vine. Receive. I was receiving from God while I was down there and they were up here singing. I was receiving nourishment that comes from God. I received. We have to do this on a daily basis. It's called intimacy. Come on in into the most holy place. Come on in. Do you remember when Jesus cleansed the temple? He went into the temple, overturned the muddy tables. He was cleansing the temple. And what did he say? This is my father's house. My father's house is a house of prayer. And you have turned it into a den of thieves. He was talking to those who studied the word of God continually. You have turned it into a den of thieves, but my father's house is a house of prayer. Is there a temple today, yes or no? A, a building. That is a temple of the Lord on earth. Is there a temple today? They're making plans to build the temple in Israel, but they haven't done it yet. I was just there last January. They haven't done it yet. They're collecting, they're planning, they're preparing. Because we're at the final age of the church age. What is the temple today? The church age it's the believers who have faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. It's us. My Father's house, that's us, should be a house of prayer. I want to see myself as a house of prayer. You should see yourself as a house of prayer. We are to be a house of prayer. We are the containers of the most living God. That's us. And we should see ourselves as a house of prayer. My prayer coach, sitting right there, my prayer coach says, in prayer, press on. Push in prayer. What are we pressing on to? On to the most holy place. What are we pushing past in prayer? Our flesh. We got to push past the flesh into the most holy place. The flesh can't go into the most holy place. And in prayer, we've got to push and push and give God our all in prayer. And in prayer, we can enter into the most holy place. What does God do when we finally get past the flesh? 
as long as you're thinking about what am I going to cook for dinner, you're not past the flesh. As long as you're still feeling the pressure and the weight of the bills on you, you're not past the flesh. As long as Timmy or Johnny still bother you, you're not past the flesh. You have to get into God, and you've got to pray to God, and you need to get past that until it's just you and God. Jesus did it with loud cries, loud cries in prayer. Jesus prayed a lot. Enoch walked in such a way he was close to God. He had this testimony that he was close to God. And one day he disappeared for God just took him. Enoch, seventh from Adam. We are to pray and get a hold of God and push and push and push. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Gee, one time I stopped praying and my prayer coach said, why did you stop? And I said, I had to breathe. She said, you don't need to breathe. You don't need to breathe. You need to get past your flesh. She likes me a whole lot better when I'm past the flesh and full of the Holy Spirit. My desire for my life is to be full of the Holy Spirit, the overflow level. Amen? Work diligently to improve. Paul says, keep on praying, Romans 12, 12. Paul says, never stop praying, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. This prayer, uh, James says to pray fervently, James 5, 16, and be righteous. Pray with energy. Pray fervently. Fervently. <laughs> with zeal. Pray that way. And be righteous. Match that with right living. And it produces wonderful results, and it has great power. Those kind of prayers. Prayer with your heart and prayer with right living is powerful, and it produces wonderful results. Work diligently to improve your prayer life. Paul says, be persistent in your prayers for all the believers everywhere. Ephesians 6.18. Jesus says, be persistent in your requests to him. Colossians 4.2 says, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. We let our minds go to sleep. And we're not always thankful. But we are to be devoted to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Be a house of prayer. Freshness comes from hearing from God. If you're bored with your job, you're bored with your life, you're bored with your husband, you're bored with your wife, freshness comes from hearing from God. Adventure comes from following God. Pray out loud, shout it out, praise, worship, songs, give yourself to God, lay down your life in prayer, lay down your life, Give your life to God in prayer. Allow yourself to be changed into his glorious image. Pray in the spirit. I'm just going to finish with these lists. There was a guy that lived from 1555 to 1626. His name was Lancelot Andrews. And I'm just going to share two lists that came from his private devotionals concerning prayer. Times of prayer, and I'm closing. Times of prayer, always, without ceasing at all times, three times a day, in the morning, a great while before day, at daybreak, the third hour of the day, about the sixth hour of the day, the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, the evening, by night, at midnight, that was in his prayer journal. Another thing in his prayer journal was this. Places of prayer. Where do you pray? In the assembly and in the congregation like we did this morning. Your closet. An upper room. A house by a housetop. Go up on the roof. The temple. On the shore. A garden. On their beds. A desert place. In every place. 
The truth is there is no limit to the times, places, and different ways you can pray. Do you want intimacy with God? Do you want a spiritual closeness with God? Do you want your, your life described as being hot, on fire? Remember, Jesus said, I would like that you were hot or cold. Hot making it in, cold not making it in. But he prefers one or the other in, instead of just saying, I'm a Christian, and then you're more concerned about your daily life in this very temporal area where we're only a vapor. It's so short in comparison to eternity, it's hardly worth mentioning. And yet all of our attention, 98% of our attention is how we're going to live. Oh God, how am I going to live on this earth? And you don't even see God. Come on a little closer. Push on a little further. Drop off a little bit of that flesh. Drop it off. Rosemary says, be light on your feet. Be light on your feet. Not, not like that. Be light on your feet. Press into God. Push into God. Get to know him. Come up. A, you will enjoy your life. Come up against the presence of the living God. And then shine. God bless you. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Folks, we ha we've been schooled. Today we have been schooled. I can see a little bit of the gym teacher coming out of you. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for speaking clearly and, and simply. Folks, Barb gave us way too much of word of God for us to say this is not true of me. Because either I believe you or I believe him. And I choose to believe him. Amen. Folks, so much is depending on us believing that this is God's will for us. Amen. We are perfect in his sight. Now, that perfection is being worked out in a process, and the key is that we stay connected. Amen. And prayer really is just another word for connected. It doesn't always mean on your knees. It has to involve times of that concentrated communication that we think of as prayer. But prayer, you guys, and this is how we pray without ceasing, is somehow there's always a connection. You might be at work, but your, your mind and heart is connected. You, you might be at home doing chores, but your heart and mind is connected. And when we are in that place in God... Amen. We see him in ourselves. And others see him in us. And his kingdom gets expanded, which is ultimately his will. And it's more about his glory than our glory or even our well-being. Folks, we can't live that way without being truly connected. We can't. Amen, right? <laughs> right. We, we just can't in and of ourselves. Someday we will lay down this flesh. And that glorified body is going to really be something, I guess. But, folks, this so encourages me. I hope it doesn't discourage you or else you've really missed the message. Amen. This is God's will for us. And that better version of you is still on its way. And you ought to desire it because he desires it. And you ought to be patient with yourself because he's patient with you. Amen. He's still working on me. But folks, it's up to us to stay connected. To stay prayerful. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Folks, all of that, though, depends on being plugged into the vine in the first place. That's the issue of placing your trust in Christ Jesus. Amen. Or else it's impossible for that better version of you to show up. You, you can't win a race that you've never entered. So, folks, some of us here may need to acknowledge, look in our hearts, acknowledge that we're sinners. That we need a Savior. In Jesus Christ, you're the Savior. And you also want to be my Lord. But first, he's got to be your Savior. Then he's willing to lead you. But first, he's got to be the Savior. But folks, if you've made Jesus Christ your uh, Savior already, then the Lordship of Christ will bring you to this place that we're talking about. Where we become more concerned with what he wants than what we want. That's the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So uh, if you would join me and stand as I pray, because you're either one or, or the other of those two options. Amen. And if you give your heart to Christ today, if you know within yourself that you are surrendering to Jesus Christ, please do let me know because I would love to baptize you. That's a biblical ordinance of obedience. Amen. It's a privilege to be openly identified with Jesus Christ. But he does know your heart. Amen. So if that is your heart today, hallelujah. Welcome to the family. <laughs> Amen. Join us in, in staying connected though. The rest of us, if we've already uh, 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 started, folks, we've just been challenged today uh, to what most of us know is God's will for us. You know, a lot of distractions, a lot of reasons that we can give for why we're not farther in the process. But you know what? Just say, Lord, have mercy on me today. And help me, Lord, to live hard after you today. Amen. I still remember that, that phrase of it's, it's easy to serve God hard. It's hard if you serve God easy. Folks, may we be, uh, those of us that have surrendered our lives already, be reminded that you want to go after God hard. Because that will make things easy. <laughs> go after him easy. It's going to make things hard. Amen. So, Jesus, we thank you, O oh Lord, for a time of worship. The Lord, is just another way in which we connect. Lord, we thank you for a corporate time of worship. Lord, we ought to worship every day, uh, Lord, just individually. But, God, we have this first day of the week, Lord, as is our tradition, dear God. And, uh, so we thank you, Lord, for that uh, time today. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the word. Amen. Lord, truly bread of life for us today. Uh, Lord, spiritual food, God, to live on. Lord, we're going to starve without instruction from you. Lord, thank you for reminding us today, dear God, of our need to connect with you. Lord, we connect initially, we call it salvation. Lord, we connect, connect continuously, Lord, we call that discipleship. Lord, may everyone here, dear God, be one or the other. Lord, as you called each and every one of us at some point in our lives and we, we uh, uh, heard our name, Lord, we responded in faith. Thank you, Lord, for drawing us through your Holy Spirit. Lord, if you're doing that work right now, dear God, I pray, Lord, uh, Satan, I speak against you from being a hindrance. Uh, Lord, may that word be clear in the, in the mind and the heart of a, any individual, Lord, who just needs to acknowledge they are a sinner, Lord, and they need a Savior. In Jesus Christ, you're the Savior. Hallelujah, Lord, that they might start their journey of eternal life now. Lord, for those of us that are past that, Lord, thank you for the reminder again. Lord, that the key thing is to say, plugged into the vine. Amen. Hallelujah. Lord, that's the life, Lord. You're not asking us to manufacture. You're asking us to let you flow through us. Lord, and good things will be produced, Lord. 
better things than we're going to do with our own lives, Lord. Hallelujah, God. Help us to believe it today afresh. Afresh, Lord, and should we live to see tomorrow, let it be fresh. Come tomorrow, Lord, for each and every one of us, oh God, that has started our journey. Hallelujah, Lord. We pray a blessing, Lord, over Rosemary and, and Barb. Lord, thank you for 27 years. Lord, thank you that their passion is fresh today. Lord, may this time here in the States, Lord, prove beneficial Lord, as they return, dear God, to the field that, uh, where you have placed them, oh Lord. We thank you, dear God, to be connected to them, Lord, in ministry. Our Savior, help us, Lord, to hold them up uh, more so in prayer. Amen. Uh, Lord, thank you for the privilege of, of, uh, of giving to their ministry. Lord, may that continue. Lord, thank you for the family of God, Amen. brothers and sisters. Lord, connected to one another, Lord, by our connection to you. So, Savior, keep them, Lord, until we're able to see them again. Lord, watch over us, dear God, as we leave this place, Lord, not to forget what we've heard. But, God, to uh, allow you to work in us that greater connection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.